the section I've been reading a bunch lately that I'm really looking forward to trying because I haven't really done it much before is generating um, magical sentient swords. Um, the, this whole like six page spread on these swords is very, very interesting and really has the creative juices flowing. I'm wondering, have you used um, sentient swords much uh, in your games? Um, what are some of the designs that you've made? And if you haven't, what would you create of one? Hope you have a great day. Continue making the podcast or a great lesson. Talk to you again soon. Hi, it's John and Hannah here again from the Red Dice Diaries podcast. Hi. And the voicemail you heard before the intro music was from Kevin at the Red Caps podcast. We received this a short time ago when we put it in a voicemail episode and we did a a short answer to that. But we wanted to delve into it a little deeper. So, John. Yep. Sentient Swords. Yep. In old school essentials, yeah, I had a look at it. Yes, I have. Yeah, now um, this is a old school essentials is pretty much a straightforward port from the basic expert edition of basic D and D, which is like the layout and a few contradictions cleaned up. So sentient swords have a long history going back in D and D. Now the way it works in old school essentials, if you randomly generate a sword like a magical sword as part of a treasure there is a a small probability that that sword might be an intelligent sword the book suggests that you want to make it about a 30 percent chance of it being intelligent um, if a sword has a special purpose then it's more likely to be intelligent and if it's a magical sword that is intelligent, there's a 1 in 20 chance it's going to have a specific purpose. That's why it's intelligent. And it also has the, all the normal abilities that a magic sword can have of whatever type it would be. Now, if you determine that a magic sword does possess sentience, what you do is there's a table to determine the special purpose, if it has one. You then work out the sword's intelligence and personality. It has an intelligence of 1d6 plus 6, Swords with a special purpose always have an intelligence of 12. It has its own personality and should be played as an NPC. The sword's intelligence determines the means by which it can communicate, and that ranges from the lower intelligence, where they can't communicate directly, but they can sort of empathically sort of broadcast feelings to the wielder, up to speech, and even being able to read in a number of different languages based on the intelligence of the sword. There's a table for determining their alignment on the sort of classic three alignment axis of basic D&D, being lawful, neutral and chaotic. The sword's intelligence also determines the number of powers it has. So, And these are categorised into two different categories. There are sensory powers, which are sort of ones that let you detect evil, detect good, um, detect traps, stuff like that then they have extraordinary powers as well. And now most most sentient swords with an intelligence of 7 to 11 are only going to have a varying number of sensory powers. If it has an intelligence of 12, though it has three sensory powers and one extraordinary power. So every sword that has a specific purpose will have an extraordinary power. And these vary tremendously from the wielder being able to fly to inflicting like a ridiculous amount of damage to illusions, healing, telekinesis, telepathy, teleportation, and even x-ray vision. And there's a table for determining that randomly if you want. The last thing you work out is the sword's ego rating, which is a measure of their personality. You roll this by using a d12, and what happens is a sentient sword, it can at various points because it's got its own personality, attempt to exercise control over the person who wields it. And it gives some suggestions as to when it might do that. You know, like first contact, uh, if the character's reduced to half hit points, if there's an alignment difference, or if it gets an opportunity to fill its special purpose. And the way this works is you determine the sword's will score by adding its intelligence and ego together. It gets an extra one for each extraordinary power it has, because there are like some roles on these where you can get extra extraordinary powers. You then determine the wielder's will score, which is their strength and wisdom added together, and that's modified if they're injured. Um, you compare the will scores. If the sword's will score is higher, it can take control of the character's actions. 
and it gives some guidelines in here for when the sword takes control, the referee determines the behaviour of the character via the sword. For example, like jealousy, discarding other weapons, or ignoring newly discovered magic weapons, uh, glory, charging into battle to gain glory for the sword. Once in control, the sword will only release the character when the circumstance that triggered the control check is over, or the sword is otherwise satisfied. So that's a very sort of brief description of how the rules work in old school essentials. So can I just double check a detail with you? Yeah, of course you can. The treasure when you're generating it. Yeah. What's the chance of you getting a magic sword? Okay, well... Because you said one in three of those is... Let me scroll back through the big treasure book. Okay, so it really depends on the, the type of creature or the type of layer you're in, mm-hmm. because there's a number of different treasure tables, which will say there's a percentage chance of a magic item. Then within the treasures book, there's a, a table which determines what that magic thing will be. Now, if you, on this sort of like D percentile table, there's two columns, there's the basic column and there's the expert column the expert column tends to be like things that are slightly more complicated sort of higher level stuff the basic tends to be a lower level or simpler stuff on the basic if you roll a 71 to 90 on your d100 table there's a magic sword in the expert around about a 20 percent chance in the expert one it's 76 to 95 and we should specifically note that so in old school D&D it's only really swords that are sentient so you can roll other magic weapons but they won't be sentient Okay. and then once you've got a magic sword there's a table again split into basic and expert that determines like what actual sort of sword it is whether it's like mm-hmm. a sword plus one, a sword plus two or whatever and it said it should be about a 30% chance yeah it says they be sentient. Yeah, it says here some magic swords have an inte- innate intelligence and personality, along with other special powers. Obviously, see the relevant table. If the referee wishes to randomly determine whether a magic sword is intelligent, the probability is thirty percent. Although, obviously, you can override that as the GM if you wish. And then, obviously, you go on to generate the magic sword per the rules we've just talked about. So they're going to turn up reasonably often in these games. Yeah, if you use the the random allocation chance, as it said, although personally, given how much of an impact these sort of things can have on games, I wouldn't put a magic sword into a game randomly. I think if you're going to find one, it's going to be like the end of a quest or you're specifically looking for like a fabled legendary sword or something like that. So have you used them in a game recently? Yeah, in fact, we recently had an enchanted sword in my Old School Essentials campaign, and that was in part spurred on by the the brief discussion we had with Kevin in the the previous voicemail episode. Um, the, The characters in my game, they are questing for an ancient sword in the ruins of an abbey, which is reputed to be able to like lay the undead to rest. And after that discussion, I thought, oh, it'd be kind of fun because they've not really got any like NPCs with them or anything. It'd be kind of fun to have it as a sentient sword. And I sort of, I did generate the powers randomly using the the rules from this book, but the sort of like the personality I picked, since it was like laying evil and dead to rest, I went for a lawful alignment. And I gave it the personality of sort of, you think like Brian Blessed out at the start of like um, Prince of Thieves. You know, when he's sort of like, he's like a, this robust, like, Knights Templar is all about the quest and for honour and glory and stuff like that. Okay, so what do they add to the game? Well, I think, as we said earlier, they're effectively an NPC in their own right, as well as an item. So they, they do double duty, almost, because you get the the bonuses and the abilities that it has. And obviously, it has, like, normal magic sword stuff, then sentient sword abilities on top of it. So it's a powerful magical item, but it it's not like a normal magical item where you just do a bit of experimenting. You normally work out what its powers are fairly quickly. Because it has a personality, you almost have to like barter with it like you would an NPC. So if the sword decides you're not using any of its powers, well, well you're out of luck. So it brings in 
a, a bit of that sort of bargaining and that sort of conversational role play, but has a bit of a different tint to it because you're not just negotiating with a tavern keeper for some rumours or an employer. You're actually negotiating with a weapon and you're motivated to do so because you know if you can get it on board, you've got access to all those powers. And in the one in my campaign at the minute, they've not even they've discovered one of like the number of powers it's got and that was that was like a sort of mind readery style thing where they've dis- I basically said to one of the other characters like oh who'd been that sass in the sword what are you thinking and he told and it was Colin's character and he said he was thinking oh maybe we can explore this dungeon or oh, no I've got a bit beat up though because he tried to pick up the sword and because his alignment was different he took some damage from it and he'd sass in the sword like oh you nearly killed me and the sword's like well it's not my fault you're not worthy enough to wield me and then Johannes's character is lawful picked it up and he was fine and um, the way I described the sword as speaking is that it sort of spoke through Johannes's mouth but with an obvious different voice and I basically said to Colin what's your character thinking he's like oh, I'm thinking about going to this dungeon but I'm a bit beat up maybe I should, we should go back and have some rations or oh, maybe I can find some of them like pork pies that I like so much and uh, I just described to Johannes I'm like, as you look at Colin's character you sort of hear like an echoey version of that but you can see his lips aren't moving so he's sort of like, oh, right, the sword can obviously like read thoughts. And I was like picking up on that because I was connected to it. But he doesn't know what other powers the sword's got at all. I can see them being quite useful for when the GM wants to be able to sort of put a voice into the game and be able to steer the characters here and there. But I can also see them being quite an entertaining way to have an NPC in there who's not necessarily working for the good of the group as a whole. He's got his own agenda and therefore is going to be stirring the pot, so to speak, between the different player characters. Yeah, exactly. And another use for them as well is obviously weapons and swords and stuff like that, particularly enchanted ones. Like anything that's enchanted tends to be immune to like normal wear and tear. Yeah, if you find like a magic ring, like the body of the person who was wearing it might have decayed to dust, but the ring is fine. But you find some leather armour, leather would rot away over hundreds of years, but it's magical leather armour, so it's fine. So if you think about it, if you've got a sentient sword, that could have been around for a long old time. But unless it's being wielded, it's an impassive observer. So the the play characters in my game they were asking this sword you know like oh you've been in this abbey for like a long time and it's telling them about the history of the abbey but it can only tell them about things that happened in its immediate area and because this sword spent so many hundreds of years like sealed away in this box to prevent it falling into the wrong hands like it couldn't tell them anything about recent history because it was like i've been stuck in a stone box for for like the last like 500 years like what, what do you want so it's also useful as a bit of a bit of a sort of plot drop NPC, if you wish. I can see the sword that's been in the trophy case in the king's private chambers, having access to a lot of information and that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, it's like it in the uh, in my OSE game. The, the players were saying to the sword, they were like, oh, um, what happened to the abbey? How did it fall into disrepair? What happened to like the warriors who lived here? And it was like, I, I was in the armoury. I, I, I knew there was some panic going on, and I heard a few snatches of conversation, but obviously people don't tend to like pour their hearts out to a sword or discuss important things where a sword might be. So it's useful because you can give the player some information, but as long as you keep in mind that it's it would only know like what has happened around it you can limit that information so you don't just have to go here's everything but you can be like here's some hints here's some little tips to like get you to like go out and like find out more so it can give like little clues and stuff but you don't have to like blurt the whole sort of like plot line out so what about bad uses for magic swords Okay, well, one of the things I was wary of is because the the sword that they've got, because it has a purpose, and I rolled like a ridiculous high intelligence for it, mm-hmm. it makes it very powerful, but it also means if it tries to take you over, because it's just a straight number comparison, there's no roll, it's probably going to do it. Now, one of the things I was very wary of is 
I don't want every five minutes this sword to be like taking over Johannes's character or whoever's holding it because that's not fun. You just going like, oh, well, I can't do anything and me playing your character for half an hour isn't fun. It's your character. So, but, and I was I was a bit concerned about how I was going to, because this sword's very like bluff and let's go out and quest and fight evildoers. But the, the player characters were quite cool because they basically went, Oh, Johannes goes, oh, what we need to do, Sword, is like, we need a moment alone because we're going to strategize for our big quest. And the Sword was like, oh, capital idea, strategizing. Yes, you go ahead. And then the Sword was all, like, quiet. <laughs> so they don't, So they obviously sort of, like, because it has a personality, but it's not like a full human rounded personality. It's like, I have this purpose. That's what I'm bothered about. So the Sword in my game, it's like honor and questing and like, fighting evildoers and whatever. And um, if you can work out where the boundaries of that personality are you can sort of play on it so if they'd have just gone sword we've had enough of your sass be quiet it would have probably got lippy and like might have tried something but because they were like oh yeah we're going on a quest sword and we are going to fight evildoers but we need a moment to like strategize first and work out how how we're going to do this quest the sword was like fair enough you get your strategy on so i didn't really have to worry about it because my players handled it I would advise if you're using a sentient sword in a game, use it with a bit of a light touch. So you don't want it like butting into conversations every five minutes. So when we first talked about this, it occurred to me that I'd never use them in games. Yeah. And that's because they are sort of one of these tropes that you hear about being overused a bit. Yeah. And having like loads of them sort of feels a bit like Pokemon. You know, yeah, gotta catch them all. all. All these like magical extra pets and things that you yeah. end up accumulating through D and D. Um, you know, one person's got a familiar, someone else has got their steed, someone else has got a wolfhound, and this guy's got a magic sword, and the GM's got to keep track of all of that in addition to the player group. Yeah, but it also struck me while we were thinking about this episode that a game where sort of the background is based around that idea of loads of sentient magic swords all over the place that mostly just want to fight because they're swords could be quite an entertaining sort of a society to build on and would probably look a bit like the Pokemon society where the people have just gone like, all right, swords, you want to fight, do you? Okay, we'll put you guys in arenas with some humans that can wield you and the rest of us will just get on with the rest of life. Yeah, I I think in that situation you're describing, it could be a really cool piece of it. But that's because you've got a background that's specifically Mm -hmm. like created to handle that. Indeed. I think if we're talking like your standard pseudo medieval like dungeon crawler D and D, you really need to be careful with like how many of these like (laughs) enchanted swords, familiars and stuff like that you introduce. And I tend to treat all of those as like NPCs. And I think they should, the NPCs in a party should never overwhelm the player characters because the player characters are what the game's about. And I'm not saying they should get preferential treatment just because they're player characters. Because, you know, if a player character does something stupid and there's consequences, they have to deal with that. But if you have a lot of NPCs, they shouldn't be stealing the spotlight from the player characters. So my my character my player characters in my OSC game at the minute they're talking about going back to civilization and like taking on some more hirelings because like, there's only three of us like if we get into like a combat like a couple of us go down that's it game over so we need to hire some like men at arms to like beef us up a bit but it, and I'm fine with them doing that but if they do that aside from like the odd few occasions or like generally saying like oh yeah the men at arms want to talk to you about this I'll keep them in the background in terms of like their personalities and I'll let the players move them about during the combat but they I won't use them to outshine the player characters and I think the same should be said of sentient swords much as I'd have great I'll have great fun like any time they want to talk to the sword but like playing this like ridiculous Brian Blessed like esque sword I'm not going to have it keep like interjecting into conversations constantly because that's not what it's there for so you did mention that you don't get other sentient items in this game system. Yeah, and so is there in, any justification for it? I'm I'm not 
entirely sure, to be honest. Um, I, I know you don't get, you don't tend to get all the sentient weapons in the same way as you do with swords. Certainly not with the older versions of D and D. That might have changed in later editions. I honestly don't know because I, I don't run them as much. But I'm guessing it was probably just due to the fact that when you come across like a a really like massive enchanted weapon, certainly in like western mythology it tends to be a sword like you know think of excalibur and like caliber and whatever mm-hmm. that they're all swords and i suppose that's partly because back in those like medieval times the sword was a very sort of widespread weapon you know it it was like if if you were gonna if you're gonna just go into like a if you're like a soldier type or whatever and you're gonna go into a blacksmith and be like i want a basic weapon it was probably a sword and like I'm no I'm no massive weapon historian, so like people out there, if I'm wrong with that, I do apologise. But to me, it's like the ubiquitous like medieval weapon. You think of like a medieval warrior, he's got a sword. You think of the common sort of rendition of a knight, it's either a lance if he's mounted, or a sword if he's on foot. And we know knights wielded other things, maces, flails, etc. But there's just something about that like romantic imagery of the sword that sort of it's pretty much intertwined with fantasy. So I'm guessing that that's probably why swords were the sentient ones. Fair enough. Um, so how specifically are they made in this game? Obviously they're generated in the treasure piles, but where do they come from in the first place? It, it doesn't really give any guidelines, it's only in old school essentials, as to how sentient swords are made. They're, they're in that sort of nebulous, like, Oh, it was a time before time when they had ancient magics we don't have now. And they and you find them in ancient treasure halls. You don't just like rock down to like the, the local enchantress and be like, what me up a magic sword. And certainly I quite like that to be honest, because as soon as you say this is how they're made, again you're in that sort of Pokemon style thing where like mm-hmm. everyone who's got the dollar is gonna be like, Oh, here's my GP, magic sword me. <laughs> So, which, which is fine if you wanted to do that, and you could certainly come up with guidelines as to how to make them, but I, I prefer to leave it mysterious, to be honest. Fair enough. So, anything else you want to say about magic swords? Uh, well, I was going to say we talked about the fact that it's only swords, but to be honest, looking at these these guidelines for sentient swords in old school essentials in the treasures book literally all you need to do but let's say you wanted to go oh, i want to have like a an intelligent a sentient mace instead of a sentient sword what you've got to do on this table here where it tells you what type of sword it is where it mm-hmm. says sword plus two you just cross out the word sword and put mace mm-hmm. now that's that's literally all that would be involved now like I, I said say the thing that was in my mind when i was asking you about it is uh, magic mirror often those are sort of sentient characters in their own right I I think you certainly you certainly could apply the sentient item creation rules to other things Um, the powers not all of them but a lot of them are obviously slanted towards weapons because it assumes you're only going to be using swords but you could easily just re-roll or pick ones that are appropriate and I don't think that would be a problem so they say if you go oh yeah we've got like a giant sort of like ballroom mirror or whatever I'm going to make it sentient. Again, you work out its intelligence score, its ego score. Mm -hmm. If it's got a special purpose, what its Mm -hmm. alignment is, you roll a smattering of powers from the table, you've got a sentient mirror. Cool. Like I say, the the core sort of old school BX is its only swords. But one of the great things about the old school sort of D&D is it encourages you to to change the rules and mix them up as suits your campaign. So you want sentient maces, you want sentient mirrors, you want to retrofit your whole setting so like every sword's enchanted like you were suggesting earlier go for it do do what you want to do it's your game at the end of the day so with that thanks to kevin from the red cat podcast yeah thank you very much kevin that's been our slightly sort of like deeper delve into the wonderful world of sentient swords we hope you've enjoyed it and you get something out of it and if anybody has any suggestions for future episodes they'd like to see, any questions they'd like to ask us, please send them in. And you can do that by leaving us a voicemail message on SpeakPipe. There's a link in the description of this show. Or you can send us an email to rdrpgpodcast at gmail.com. 
until we see you next time take care stay safe and keep gaming bye